I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel calls on Russia to stop Iran from establishing itself permanently in Syria. The Israeli Prime Minister undergoes a fourth round of questioning for corruption charges. And history lovers, get ready because a major archaeological discovery has just been made in the Holy Land. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Iran has been steadily increasing its influence in the Middle East as the six-year-old Syrian conflict rages on. Now, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced that he's going to Moscow for talks with the Russian president to express vigorous opposition to the possibility of Iran establishing a permanent presence in Syria. <laughs> לגבש שם הסדר, במסגרת ההסדר הזה, או גם בלעדיי, יש ניסיון של איראן להתבסס באופן קבוע בסוריה או בנוכחות צבאית קרקעית ובנוכחות צבאית ימית וגם בניסיון הדרגתי לפתוח מולנו חזית ברמת הגולן הנשיא. According to Jerusalem officials, Israel has already stopped Iran from moving forces into the Syrian Golan Heights several times, which is just over Israel's northern frontier. Iran has even deployed the nation's revolutionary guard forces in the region, as well as the nation's Shiite Muslim proxies. In response, Israel has carried out dozens of strikes to prevent weapon smuggling to the Iranian-backed Lebanese terror group Hezbollah through Syria. The Israeli Prime Minister now wants to discuss a recent agreement with Russia to coordinate military action in the skies over Syria, all as a means of avoiding the accidental trading of fire. <laughs> While both Moscow and Tehran are allies of the Damascus government, it's Russia that seems to be holding the balance of power in achieving any future deal on Syria's future. Yet the first UN-led peace talks held in a year to resolve the conflict ended last Friday without a breakthrough in sight. For the fourth time since the opening of the investigation, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is being questioned by police as to why he accepted expensive gifts from wealthy businessmen and then acted in their interests. ILTV's Aaron Porras joins me here with more on this story. Aaron. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, the case dubbed Case 1000 is being conducted by the Lachav 433 Anti-Corruption Police Unit. And while they have stated that the, that the Premier's frequent travel recently has delayed the results of the investigation, they do believe that the result will be in a, a criminal indictment. In February, the Lachav Police Unit said that depending on the results, they would most likely choose between two options to charge the Prime Minister with breach of trust, or to charge Netanyahu with both breach of trust and accepting a bribe. Netanyahu's response to the reports released in a statement was that the police couldn't possibly know everything until the investigation is over, and that, quote, what more is there to investigate if they indicated that they will recommend an indictment? This is what happens when preconceived notions clash with facts. Like I've said before, there will be nothing because there is nothing, end quote. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is here in Israel on an official trip for meetings with national leaders, and the American leader used a visit to the Jewish state's Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem to pledge action against the surge of anti-Semitism currently raging across the U.S. Israeli President Ruven Rivlin escorted the governor on the tour of Yad Vashem, where Cuomo laid a wreath to commemorate the six million victims of genocidal hatred. His trip comes in the wake of a mass wave of threats against the American Jewish community, and he arrived in Israel only hours after reports that a Jewish cemetery in his own state had just been vandalized. The desecration is the fourth case in the last two weeks. And we must have zero tolerance for any abuse or discrimination of any fellow human being. In New York now and in the United States, we've had a rash of anti-Semitism, over 100 acts of anti-Semitism. And I'm sad to say also in my state, the state of New York, 
It is disgusting. It is reprehensible. It violates every tenant of the New York State tradition. It turns out the damage to the Brooklyn Cemetery wasn't actually vandalism, according to police. The NYPD says the 42 tombstones toppled over as a result of long-term neglect, lack of maintenance, and soil erosion. But the governor is still vowing that any hateful action against Jewish American citizens will not go unanswered. These acts of anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. New York State has reacted aggressively with extraordinary measures, more aggressively than any other state in the nation, I am proud to say. We have posted rewards. We have put together a special unit of the state police. We've made it clear that there will be no tolerance for these acts of anti-Semitism. My sadness is that now another generation of young people has had to experience this pain, a pain that for many young people was only in the history books, is now very much in their daily lives. Israel's president echoed those sentiments during his own remarks. There is one lesson from the Holocaust, never again. Jews must be safe wherever they are, wherever they are in the world, especially and specifically in the United States. Let us see none of this again. All right, a controversial new bill is being advanced that would immediately hand passports to newcomers as soon as they immigrate to Israel. Law enforcement officials agree that such a move would make the lives of many immigrants easier, but they're worried the main people who will benefit could end up being criminals. Today, new Israelis can only be issued passports once they've been living in the country for an entire year and can officially prove that it's their primary place of residence. The Israel Beitenu party is now pushing to make it so that these immigrants can get passports right away, saying it's not necessary for them to live in Israel full time and that it should be easier for them to visit their relatives back home during those first 12 months. But the Public Security Ministry is against the legislation, and so are the police. A position paper on the topic from the Police Investigations and Intelligence Unit says the waiting period is necessary to conduct background checks. It specifically accuses immigrants from the former Soviet Union of wanting to exploit Israel and its national passport, as they have in the past. Israeli Defense Minister and Israel Beitenu Party Chief Avigdor Lieberman is shooting back by slamming that document as a hate crime against the nation of his birth. His faction is also pointing out that all immigrants are already required to provide records showing criminal-free backgrounds. Besides that, they say anyone can be denied citizenship if there's intelligence that they're planning to use their Israeli nationalities for illicit purposes. For now, the bill is moving forward to the Knesset, where it has to be debated and approved in three separate sessions before it can become law. For the past 100 years, modern medicine has been dependent on antibiotics to help fight bacterial diseases. But what happens when bacteria evolves to the point where antibiotics are no longer effective? Today, over 2 million Americans suffer from antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and close to 700,000 people die annually from them. By 2050, that number is estimated to jump to 10 million. Joining me in the studio today is CTO Dr. Niv Bachnoff and Dr. Moshe cohen -Kut the CEO of Omnix Medical. Thank you guys for coming Thank in. Thank you very much. All right, so let's begin. Why do people become <clears throat> resistant to antibiotics? I know that seems like a simple question, but break it down for those of us who don't know much about the science. Okay, so, so um, the widespread use of antibiotics has led to the uh, uh, development of, of resistant bacterial strains. These bacteria are no longer susceptible to the conventional antibiotics that are used in clinics uh, today and in hospitals. Uh, the reason for that is the strategy in, uh, uh, that, that is employed uh, uh, when developing antibiotics or conventional antibiotics. And the reason for that is because antibiotics uh, target a very specific process which is vital to the bacteria. And by inhibiting this process, we manage to kill the bacteria. But the bacteria have a very rapid uh, evolution and they overcome this inhibition very easily. So in other words, we need to start creating new antibiotics exactly. for people to be able to stay well. Now, 
why are these bacteria resistant antibiotics so dangerous? I mean, that's a kind of basic question. But. Because when somebody is ill and there is nothing you can do to to um, to help them, to help them, so it's it's highly dangerous. Think about it. If somebody is suffering from pneumonia, if we don't give him antibiotics, mm -hmm. he will die. And if we give me, if if he gets a superbug that does not um, have any treatment, have any treatment. You will eventually die. Right. So I mean, this is a, a serious issue. and dangerous um, problem that we have to to deal with now in the 21st century. Now, now, how is your company working to stop this issue, and why have there been no major pharmaceutical companies that have been tackling this problem? Uh, well, well, uh, it's very interesting, but uh, there hasn't been a new class of antibiotics in the past 30 years. We have not seen any new antibiotic in the past 30 years. And the reason for that is that all the major pharmaceutical companies believed that we've got this covered. There's no problem with bugs. There's no problem with bacteria. We can kill them for the rest of, uh, of uh, time. But the bacteria are very, very smart and very resilient. And they found a solution to each one of the antibiotics that we use today. And uh, uh, until five or 10 years ago, pharmaceutical companies would not invest any money in developing new kinds of antibiotics. Well, this has changed because even the big uh, players and the strategic players and everybody with the money are realizing now that if we don't take a new strategy to killing uh, uh, resistant bacteria, we will soon be back to the pre-antibiotic area where a simple cut or a simple infection can, can, can lead to death. Well, wow, it's really scary. So what have you guys done to tackle this issue? So we found out that insects have been killing bacteria for over than 250 million years using very special molecules that are part of their innate, innate immune system. And what we did is just we mimicked them. So we said, OK, this is what the nature is doing. Why don't we do it? And we took these molecules and we and made an adaptation for them to be suitable for, for therapeutic use. And this is exactly what we are doing now. We're developing new molecules or with an, and a new class of antibiotics against resistant bacteria based on what nature is doing. Beautiful. Yeah, ju just imagine, because bacteria have been fighting bacteria, insects have been fighting bacteria for millions of years, and th they're doing it very well, because otherwise we would not have butterflies or flies today or insects, because the bacteria would have killed them all long ago. But they found a solution, and they are doing something very good, because they manage to kill all the bacteria that they come in contact with. Well, we, we looked at them and we asked ourselves, what are they doing that uh, uh, we, we can use for, for, for our therapeutic uh, uh, applications? And it, it had uh, uh, some, some, some uh, modifications had to be made, but we took a technology that has been working for millions of years and we made it uh, possible to be uh, 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 used in, 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 uh, in therapeutic world Beautiful. today. What's Have you ever seen a fly with pneumonia? No, I, I guess I haven't. I, there you go. Well, it seems like you guys have truly created uh, something that's going to help the world. And this is a huge, scary issue. Thinking about it is so overwhelming, but uh, we know who to turn to for help, right? Yes. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everyone loves Hollywood star George Clooney, but what is really company has taken a lot of heat for loving him just a little too much. The Israeli coffee business Espresso Club has been facing charges for using a George Clooney lookalike in their television ads, all in an effort to spoof Nestle's Nespresso coffee commercials. Well, it turns out Nestle was not a fan of the Israeli ads and decided to sue the company for copying. But it turns out the Tel Aviv Magistrates Court doesn't think the issue is that big of a deal and has ruled that Espresso Club didn't damage Nestle's reputation or infringe on their copyright. In in other words, the Israeli coffee company won't have to hand over a dime to Nestle Nespresso. Instead, Nestle will have to pay Espresso Club over 100,000 shekels to cover the cost of the unnecessarily spent legal expenses involved in the case. But Nestle did at least achieve one thing. From now on, Espresso Club's ad will have to feature a disclaimer informing viewers that their George Clooney lookalike isn't exactly the real Hollywood star.
may not be the real George Clooney, but he's just as cute. All right, now we know our ILTV viewers realize that contrary to lots of media reports, there's a lot more to Israel than just war and desert. In fact, all in all, it's really a great place to live. And that's just been documented by the Bloomberg Misery Index. Yes, there is actually a study that ranks the relative misery in 65 different nations, specifically regarding unemployment and inflation figures. Israel comes out as having the eighth least miserable economy in the world. That puts the Jewish state in the company of countries like Switzerland, Denmark, and Singapore. According to financial assessments, only 4.9% are looking for work, and inflation hovers around three quarters of 1%. And by the way, Israel came out as the 54th, the 54th least miserable, while the United States trailed far behind as the 49th. Now's your chance to guess the very best and the very worst countries, and the winners are Venezuela, taking the titles having the most miserable economy in the world for the third consecutive year. The runner-up is South Africa, and as far as the happiest people on Earth, well, they live in Thailand. Bloomberg thinks the picture may be a little less rosy, but looks a little brighter because of the kingdom's rather unique way of calculating employment statistics. All right, now when it comes to choosing a hotel for vacation, for many it's often all about the view. Or is it? A new hotel in the West Bank is reeling in reservations with just the opposite by offering the worst view in the world, and the entire enterprise has been created by the famous street artist Banksy. The three-story guest house is in the Palestinian Authority city Bethlehem, revered as the birthplace of Jesus. Banksy, whose real name is unknown, says that every room overlooks the West Bank's barrier wall with Israel. The mysterious artist financed the lodging and his stencil graffiti work appears throughout the rooms and hallways. Banksy have done almost everything in this building. Almost all of the paintings that you see inside the building were done by Banksy. Uh, he was involved in everything that you see around you. So it is called, it is actually Banksy's Hotel. Uh, Banksy chose the, uh, the location for the uh, uh, hotel and then developed the whole hotel as a concept. Um, he chose to put it next to the wall, uh, perhaps not for the great views, um, but for other reasons that are more artistic. Um, and hopefully it will become kind of a, an interesting destination for people to come to uh, and to learn about Palestine. The artist says he's also giving a nod to the role Britain once played in the Middle East by styling the former pottery workshop after an English gentleman's club from colonial times. The hotel was set up in secrecy and Israeli military authorities in the West Bank didn't immediately respond when asked if they had been aware of it in advance. We started this project uh, 14 months ago um, it's uh, almost four meters from the separation wall, uh, surrounded by a wall from both sides, two sides. That's why it was called the World of Hotel. And uh, as you see where we are standing, it has the probably the worst view ever that you can get from uh, like from a hotel. Almost all of the artist's previous pieces were temporary, such as his last big project in 2015 that featured model boats of refugees floating in a pond at an English theme park. There have been things like the Dismaland Amusement Park that was opened in Britain, which was a temporary uh, attraction that attracted many, you know, many, many people. And he has done galleries and things like that. So there have been lots of works of art in one place. But I don't think I've ever seen something that is such a sort of a a combination of high concept and practical, it's a hotel, you know, it's a hotel for tourists to come uh, to Bethlehem. So uh, it's, it's very different to anything he's done before. And the thing that really makes this unique for Banksy is that this is permanent. You know, normally anything Banksy does is, is a short-lived short thing. Guests are also invited to visit an on-site art gallery solely dedicated to the wall, featuring contributions from both Palestinians and Israelis. Banksy says his hotel offers a warm welcome to people across the world, including those on both sides of the conflict. Banksy and I work together to produce uh, the exhibition, um, but also with uh, a big team of Israelis and Palestinians 
uh, coming together to tell uh, stories about the wall and collect objects related to it. Palestinians say this apartheid wall is a symbol of oppression and part of Israeli attempts to grab land in the West Bank that they want for a future state. Israel began building the border fence in 2002 during the Second Intifada to prevent Palestinian terrorists from entering the Jewish state to carry out suicide bombings targeting the public. Today, Israel faced off against South Korea in the opening game of the fourth ever World Baseball Classic. Joining us on the phone all the way from Asai is Peter Kurtz, the president of the Israel Association of Baseball. Hi, Peter. Good afternoon. How are you? Great, great. You're all the way in South Korea with the Israeli team. Tell us, what are the emotions like? How are the players feeling? The emotions are incredible. Tonight was a huge win for us, uh, beating, the, beating Korea. Um, we beat them 2-1 to one in 10 innings, which is one extra inning than, uh, than, than this regulation time. For those who don't understand baseball, um, it was an incredible win. It was our, uh, Korea's number is ranked number three in the world, and Israel is ranked number 41. Um, but that's without our heritage players. With our heritage players, we're a much better team and a much stronger team. Wow. So, I mean, I can only imagine that people, you know, in South Korea right now, the Israelis that are, are, are there really feel like they're representing the country, no? Uh, yes, the Israelis definitely. The, the, um, and there's a heritage rule with, the, with this uh, world competition, which means that uh, American Jews are allowed to play for Team Israel. Um, we have five Israelis on the team and 23 American Jews playing for us. Um, these American Jews are thrilled to be playing for Israel. They're all, they're all, they're all uh, thanking us that they're, they're wearing the blue and white. Um, eight of them were in Israel this past, some, uh, this past month. Um, visiting the Holy Land, visiting the uh, the players in Israel. We have over a thousand players playing baseball in Israel uh, under the aegis of the IAB. Um, we're developing new programs. We're developing new fields. We're trying to build a new field in Beit Shemesh with the help of the JNF. And these guys are really coming together and trying to help us uh, to push baseball in Israel. Sounds beautiful. So I guess the big question here is, what can we expect from Israel during this World Baseball Classic? What's going to come next? Um, next, in a few hours, actually in about 10 hours, we play, uh, we play Taiwan. So the guys are, are just going to sleep now. It's 1 o'clock in the morning here, and they have to wake up at 7 o'clock for the bus to the ballpark. Uh, Taiwan is probably the weakest team in this division of the four teams because they've had some controversy in their association. So many of their professional players did not make the national team. So I'm hopeful that if we can, can beat uh, Taiwan tomorrow, we'll be 2-0. and And our third game will be on Thursday, make it to uh, the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands are a very, very strong team. Um, but if we're 2-1, and one, uh, hopefully we can make it out of this, uh, this, this, this division uh, because the first and second place teams make it out of here. We play against the first and second place teams from the Japanese division next week. Um, and then those top two teams go to Los Angeles for the finals. All right. Well, we're rooting for you guys. Good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. An exceptionally rare stone structure dating back to the Bronze Age has just been unearthed in the Galilee. While many of these kinds of chambers dot the Middle East, this one is unprecedented in many striking ways. Archaeologists say this is a dolmen. Dolmens were made in ancient times by hoisting a large flat stone on top of other standing ones, like a table. The discovery is 4,000 years old. It bears the first artwork ever engraved on a dolmen in the region, including some 400 others already excavated in the Jewish state. Israeli tech experts are creating a 3D model of the inscriptions to give greater insight as to their meaning, which for now remains completely unknown. The finding is also by far the largest dolmen ever discovered in this part of the world. The main chamber where the rock drawings were found is about six and a half by 10 feet. Its covering stone is estimated to weigh at least 50 tons and a heap of other crazy huge 400 ton stones nearly 66 feet in diameter shows this dolmen was hierarchical. That means it had additional cells which again is the first of this type ever identified in the Middle East. To this day no one really knows what purpose the dolmen served or even how ancient civilizations managed to erect them. Archaeologists say the level of technology involved in creating this latest monumental engineering project is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in the land of Israel. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by the University of Haifa, Hebrew Summer Ulpan. Open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Everybody gets excited when they find their lookalike. In fact, there are even people out there like Montreal-based artist Francois Brunel, who spent 12 years finding pairs of long-lost twins or really strangers that just look alike. So today's word is kafil, which means a double doppelganger or lookalike in Hebrew.
Now, they say that everyone on Earth is related, and so it makes sense that there's a kafil out there for each of us, or maybe even more than one. But kafilim or doubles can be more than just a distant cousin or someone with a similar nose. A kafil could also be a stunt or body double in a film, and it could even be a clone. So when it comes to your kafil, just remember that we're all amazing and individual, just like the people who look exactly like us. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 51 or 11 degrees Celsius. You can expect tomorrow to be partly cloudy with a drop in temperatures to roughly 69 or 21 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.69 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. Thanks for watching and see you next time.